Okay, so uh, the last time we were here, we started to look at uh, really now working on a project. Uh, uh, we had the template, which we made a copy of, and we started to work with the MySDCE project. We started to look at the handout, uh, number seven. We need to get back to that one to, to keep working with it. So you should have a copy of handout seven. We'll look at it. We did this whole section about importing our app from last month, all that that required. Remember, we still remember in the back of your mind we have um, number six to do. We may or may not do it together, or you might want to do it maybe for a challenge, which is to do what we did for the index to also do it to the map screen. What we did not do to the map screen is put the Cordova JS file in there. We didn't put any of that meta format detection. We didn't put, uh, you know, all of that stuff that we did to the index. We will need to do that at some point to the map screen. That's number six. We did all of this, and then our project from last month then should have worked. We spent time last time also to create an icon and a splash screen. So I get my cool little splash screen. Uh, cuts out in about two or three seconds and my app starts and the app from last month then comes back. One of the things that um, now we need to get used to is, well, how do we debug this? How do we, how do we work with it when we're writing more advanced code? So we'll look at these two sections about debugging with Cordova browser and debugging with real device and Google Chrome. Uh, so I like to do both of these methods because one might be faster than the other. For me, when I do taco, run, Android device, maybe it takes 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds, whatever amount of time. That's 10 whole seconds. I'm busy. And every time we do it, 10 more seconds, 10 more seconds. So perhaps a faster way will be to run the browser. That might load up in two seconds. And it's not going to be a perfect re representation of our app, but then we'll have something to work with or something to debug with. Okay, so what I've got here, if you have the Taco Platform, if you did Taco Platform Add Browser, you can use Google Chrome for some debugging tasks. So I need to open the command prompt. Remember the shortcut is that you hold shift and you right click. Let me pull it up here. So I've got a copy of today's work. So I've got a copy of today's work. Uh, you want to shift, right click it. Hold shift, right click it. Open command window here. That's the quick way, remember, to get back to into the command prompt exactly at where your project folder is. We'll run taco platform. That will simply give you a list of what platforms are installed. We should have the browser installed. So mine says, if you're using mine also, we've got Android, we've got the browser, the web browser, the Google Chrome web browser. If you don't have Google Chrome on your system, what we're about to do will not work. Google Chrome works with Google Android, so if you have Firefox, what we're about to do won't work. If you don't have the browser, you can easily add it. Taco Platform Add Browser. Don't do this if you have the installed platform of browser, obviously. But if you don't have it, you'll need to simply add it. And if we can add, what do you think we can also do? Remove. Don't do this. But if I wanted to remove a platform, for whatever reason, I don't really want to work with BlackBerry platform anymore. So I can remove it. I can do platform remove BlackBerry if I had the BlackBerry platform installed. So we have add platform, we have remove platform. We've got browser. So simply we'll run we can run taco run browser or apparently also taco emulate browser if you want to have less things to remember. Taco run browser. Let's give that a try. 
depending on your system, it may simply start up Taco Run Browser. It may simply start up, or it may give you a couple of pop-ups like about storage. Do you allow the storage quota and such? If you get a message about not being able to save, just click OK. If you get a message about storing files, click Allow. Let's see what mine does. Taco Run Browser is also like Taco Run Android or Taco Emulate Android, or Taco Emulate iOS. It's all related to each other. So this is also going to do a build. If we never did Taco Build, this will also do it so that we have the latest version of the code. So I got one pop-up right here in Chrome that says Allow storage. Remember one of the plugins we added a while ago was um, taco plugin add Cordova dash file I think and that allows for your app to access the file system of the device. So we can allow it or block it but I'm gonna allow it just so that it kind of behaves as much as an app as possible. My um, my command prompt here gave me a bunch of feedback but notice it's stuck at this point I can try to type but it's not gonna accept any input it's still processing the browser um, if you hit on your keyboard control C for cancel it'll about up terminate batch job terminate the current command if you say if you click, if you type ye yes and press enter, remember nothing in the command prompt really does anything until you press enter. You've given it a command, then you have to enter the command for it to do anything. If I say yes, now it gave me back the command prompt to further do something else. The browser is still going to be loaded up, um, which is fine, but whenever the taco browser takes over your command prompt you'll have to remember to control C I think I have it in my handout somewhere you'll have to remember to control C to get control back in Chrome press F12 on the keyboard so I've got my Chrome browser open on your keyboard press F12 my debug panel is on the right side if yours is on the bottom, I would recommend you put it on the right side, and the way you do that is you should see the three dots menu there. You click on that little menu item and you select here either float the window if you're fancy and have two monitors, leave it at the bottom, or move it to the right, dock to the right. I would recommend dock to the right. A little fun off-topic thing. Uh, these little menus, these icons, I remember that Google Chrome at least had a little wrench a while ago that the wrench was the tools and that made sense but then they've now selected this kind of icon, three lines, which is becoming more and more popular and it actually has a fun unofficial name. Does anyone know what the fun unofficial name of this type of icon is? The hamburger menu because it looks like two buns and a meat patty in the middle, right? So the hamburger menu. That's the unofficial name. Now, on the on the same food naming trip, this one has a fun unofficial name as well, this vertical three dot line. Does anyone know what that one is? The, I've heard it as the kebab menu, or the skewer menu. So it's, look at that, it's a little kebab right there. Hamburger menu, kebab menu, I think there's another one. But anyway, here on the kebab menu, on the skewer menu, you can get these extra items, these extra options, if you want to move your dock to the side. And then on the second icon, we've seen this previously. Now we're going to use it more. The second icon from the left, toggle device toolbar or shortcut control shift M. Activate that. Go ahead and activate the toggle device toolbar. You get a mobile friendly view. And then at the top, I would then recommend to, to select a specific mobile device, any one you want. I just go with the Galaxy S5. It's the first one on the list. And so now basically 
our screen will look more like a real device. So here's another way. So some of you that have been trouble to having trouble to get this running on your home computer, if you don't have enough RAM, if your processor is not as beefy as it could be and all of that, and your emulator is not working, this is one way to maybe get some of this work done because we'll be able to sort of at least see it and work with it. Vibrate feature won't work, of course, your computer won't vibrate. Unless you have a web camera, you won't be able to use camera. You know, other features. But the point of what I've got in the handout is you might find this decode or debugging system here useful. I'm reminding you how to activate it, select device, click browser reload, and then switch over to your console output. You see we have the element inspector, which we will use when we want to customize the design of our project, like, like a plain old web uh, project. But we'll be using also console a lot. Switch to console. And do you see already at the top right it's telling me three errors, one warning. So there's an error. Uncaught module, Cordova plugin status bar, status bar already defined. Well, that's not so bad, don't worry about it. It's just saying that your status bar plugin is already defined. You're trying to define it twice, don't worry. Then a bunch of feedback that says adding <coughs> proxy for the battery, accelerometer, compass file. That's that pop-up that happened about allow file access. If we had canceled it, we would have gotten an error saying we have no file access. So then in theory we have these abilities that we can use splash screen, for example. Although that one didn't quite behave either. I saw a broken picture, and that's because this part here, another error, it says fail to load fave icon. Well, we're going to need a fave icon for an app. I'm going to ignore that. But the way to fix that would be to put a fave icon .ico file into your project. But again, this is a web, this is an app. It's not a it's not a website. So I'm going to ignore that issue. Fail to load resource. Blah blah blah. Screen. Google Chrome seems to be confused with displaying the splash screen. I wouldn't worry about it. But if you fully want to test your splash screen, I'm not exactly sure how you fix that error. So again, don't worry about it because confirm that it works in various ways. Persistent file system quota granted. Okay, great, we can use the file system. And we have a warning. Errors obviously are perhaps more important to deal with. And warnings, we can decide to deal with them. This is saying deferred long-running timer task to improve scrolling smoothness. So there's some sort of bug here in Google Chrome. Again, I wouldn't worry about it. You can follow that link and read all the gory details. What I see is this. Do you see Cordova Ready? Within all of the output, Cordova Ready, why is that there? We have a message that we wrote in our JS file to give that output if everything is working. If you want to confirm inside the Kodika JS file, this is one of the things we did right there, line 7. We said, when device is ready, when the Cordova API, when the Cordova code is ready, give me some console.log output, Cordova is ready. And that's what I'm seeing right there. And we're going to see the term Taco and Cordova and PhoneGap rather interchangeably. And for all intents and purposes, they are. So if we see Cordova rather than Taco, it's probably okay. What's that undefined? Well, if I'm trying to figure it out, Cordova, uh, Chrome is telling me, check your Codica file, line 34. So before we check it, does anyone remember? What's that about? Why are we getting undefined? Let's see. Cordova, uh, Codica, line 34. console.log, local store username. We have not added a username yet. That was when we were requesting the username and such. There's no username, so there's nothing to display on screen. It's simply going to say, welcome. Remember, if the person had added a name, it would say, welcome, Victor. But because 
no name has been given yet. We simply get some console output about undefined. And that's our if else here. If local storage is undefined, don't do anything except spit out a console log message. That's undefined. If I do customize it and put a name, reload the project, So you see it's not a website. So perhaps simply reloading doesn't give the full um, result. So we're going to have to get used to doing taco run browser. If we make changes, we can't simply reload like a plain old website. There is a, a version that's experimental where it's supposed to show you live changes. I forgot what the command is. Uh, but there's a version where we can run the browser live, but it's in beta, like everything Google does, I guess. And so I need to go back and run top of browser one more time, just to get me into the mindset of what's this, what's this uh, procedure like. So because I'm running also my recorder and other things, mine might be also slow. So you have to decide, are you going to run your project in the emulator? Are you going to run it in the real device? Are you going to run it in Chrome? So just that to show you. Okay, I'm still going to get those three uh, errors. I didn't get a warning this time. I guess I loaded nicely. I didn't get undefined because the name is defined. And I said right here, back in the command prompt, press control C and then type yes to cancel out the, to give you control back to the console and then press up to bring back the last command after making changes. Let's debug in with the browser with Google Chrome. You need Google Chrome for this to work, Firefox won't. Any questions on this section? Okay, this is the part that can be really cool for some of us and it will make others of us jealous. Because depending on your device, and we're going to be able to see right now if your device is the right one, we can control your device via Google Chrome. So let's see what my instructions say here. Uh, depending if you've got Android 4.4 and higher, you will be able to see console output at least. And even better, perhaps you might be able to control it. So in my case, because I've got a device plugged in, I would do taco run Android to see the latest version of my, of my app. So I'm assuming I already did that. I have my app already running on my device. I've done taco run Android. I go back to Chrome. I hit F12. I click the three dots menu. And this time, under the menu here, the three dots menu, the kebab menu, I have more tools, inspect devices. Google Chrome, depending on the device, like an Android device, Google Chrome can inspect a device attached. Inspect device. Mine is popping up on my device, allow debugging. I'm going to say yes and remember that. So keep an eye on your device also. It says pending authorization on my screen. Do you see that? So I'm going to say yes on my device. I'll click OK. Little green dot connected. That's my device. These settings here, leave these alone. These should be fine. It, notice here it's very subtle, but I've got settings, section selected, with settings. If I click on my device, and internally mine is the XT1528, or the Moto E second generation, whatever this thing is. If I click on it now, do you see that's highlighted? And it says, there's my device with my serial number. And I've got something running, art classes, from an 
index file. And if I click inspect, I get a new screen here that looks like the previous elements, console, etc. And so I've got my device here, learn art. I tap here, learn computers, I tap here, welcome. So I'm seeing my output from what I'm doing on my device in Google Chrome. Well, yeah, what about if I do this? Close that, open this. Yes, I am doing it with my mind. Or the mouse. And so my device is Android 5.1, I think. So it's at least the minimum, 4.4. And if you have a 4.4 device or higher, you'll be able to, via Chrome, control what's happening on your device. Not every single thing, unfortunately. Watch this. If I go to About and scroll up and click Customize, on here I get the pop-up that says Enter Your Name. And I see nothing on Chrome. I uh, type some stuff here my keyboard popped up that's, and then my screen suddenly got in half over here. Click OK, my screen goes back. So I'm able to control my device for some debugging and I'll see a console output as well. Cordova ready, clicked, all of that stuff. Um, have any of you uh, been able to get your device to run to be controlled by Google Chrome? A couple people. Okay, good. Again, um, the explanation is in my handout, and it's going to depend on your device. And so here's another way where I can use the debugging features to help me figure out the complex stuff when we talk about JSON, when we talk about databases, when we talk about that complex stuff, I need console output. I need to see where did my code go wrong. So Google Chrome is a very handy way to do it, depending on your device. And we also have the way if your device is not compatible, all is not lost. If your device is not compatible, you'll need to look at my handout. Uh, handout. You'll need to look at handout number 5, Workflow 2. That one talks about using the Android Monitor app. That one should work with every kind of device. So if your device doesn't work with Google Chrome, you'll have to check out how to do it with Monitor. And we did it, we looked at it briefly previously. You can look at it on your own. It's the Monitor bat file inside of your Android SDK folder. You run it, you do what I say here, and then you'll be able to see your console out. You'll be able to control it but you'll see console output. All right, so any questions on this debugging with a real device and Chrome? All right, let's do this next part here. This will be some coding. Cordova opens up a variety of features of your device, now accessible to your app. We will use the in-app browser to open external content within our app. So this code here is JavaScript code, but it specifically makes sense because we've got Cordova. So if I take a little segue, let's do this because we're going to be looking at Cordova several times. Let's go to cordova.apache.org. Go to your web browser and go to cordova.apache.org. Here is the manual about how Cordova works. We're using the taco version of Cordova, but it's Cordova, also known as PhoneGap. We're using the taco version of PhoneGap. So cordova.apache.org, they've recently updated their website. I've been looking at this website for years, and now it finally looks modern and cool. 
if you took our class previously, it kind of looked a little bit like a 1.0 release, and now it looks much better. It's also much more useful because you get the you get a you get a spiel here about why Cordova is amazing, and it is. But you want to go over to documentation as soon as possible. All of the handouts, I mean, all of the documentation here. If you're trying to create the projects for different devices and such, set up and such. With Cordova, we can create mobile apps, of course, but we can also create Windows apps, apps that run on Windows 8 and Windows 10. We can create Mac apps, real Mac apps that you can sell at the Mac App Store, even Ubuntu apps. What we care about, if you scroll down, you'll see plugin APIs. This is the documentation about all of the features by default that we can access of a device. The first one we're going to do here is in-app browser. So let's take a look at the in-app browser documentation just to see how it's presented to us within the Cordova site. So on the left side, scroll down to find in-app browser. And the way it'll work, it'll it'll tell you what the uh, what the browser is, and it's actually telling you right there, subtly, what you will need to type in Taco to access the to activate the plugin. There's some explanation. Plugin provides a web browser that displays when calling Cordova.inAppBrowser.open method. That's JavaScript, but it makes sense because we've got Cordova. Here's a quick example. Basically, Cordova.inAppBrowser, notice the spelling, .open method or function, and then a few parameters. All of this was explained in the documentation, of course. Uh, installation. Cordova plugin add, Cordova plugin in app browser. We've already done that. But when you create your own, scra your own app from scratch next time, you probably will not add every plugin. It's too much. Why is your calculator app asking for that to, for, to use the camera? So you only want to add really the plugins that you need. And if there's a plugin add, what must there be? Plugin remove. So later on, when, our, when we're wrapping up our project, we will remove plugins that we don't need so that we don't scare someone when they try to download our, our app and it says, this app wants to use your camera and microphone. And our app doesn't really need that. So we'll see examples, and then better yet, we'll see every single option and such that we can use. We will see that the basic syntax for this one is in-app-browser.open. You give it some URL, you give it some target, you give it some options. Um, the way they're doing it here is via a, a JavaScript um, I mean a, a yeah JavaScript uh, variable URL which is a string target can be self blank or system and it'll tell you it should tell you what the defaults are and there's options in a string in JSON format we'll talk about what JSON is a little later location yes or no for example which is a location bar do you want to show people the address bar yes or no Maybe yes to show them they've gone off to a website, maybe no to kind of keep them within the scope of your app, thinking that they haven't left your app. For some of these plugins, there will be Android only or iOS only or Windows only bits of code. Um, for example, we can use the hardware back button. So if you've got an Android device, most likely you have a back button. Would you like to tap into the back button of your device? An iOS device doesn't have a back button. It has a home button, and that's it. But your device, if Android, most likely has a back button for iOS. Different things you can do here. Windows only. This What platform is this supported on? Basically all of them. And then another example. So one way to do it. Cordova in that browser open, feeding it some options. Notice it's uh, another way here. Encode URI. If you're putting in foreign characters and such, you'll have to encode it. I'm putting here a Japanese Wikipedia page, so I have to 
encode that as Japanese text. You might see then on a particular plugin there'll be quirks. Things work a certain way on certain devices and things might work a different way on others. So Firefox has some windows. The browser has some quirks. It does it via an iframe. Um, and so forth. Again, lots of documentation, lots of detail. We're not going to read everything word by word, of course, uh, but at some point, if you have a free time or if you want to further your, your knowledge, you can, of course, look at all of this and get examples and improve your project and such. What we will actually do, I've got it right here in the handout. We're going to edit two things. We're going to write some JavaScript code, and then we need to edit our HTML code a bit. So let's uh, go to your project folder, and we need to open... In your project folder, you need to open the www folder. And then we will edit the kodika.extjs folder, I mean file. And we'll work with index in a moment, but open kodika.js in Notepad. Plus plus. Anything that we do regarding Cordova code has to be inside of the function on device ready. And again, the point of that is this function is there to allow us to easily use the Cordova code. Um, so that we don't use the code prematurely before the code before the Cordova library loads up. Someone's trying to click that in-app browser, nothing's happening. They're getting frustrated, and they go to the app store and give you one star. You know, people are very prone to very quickly give you negative reviews and such, even for the most simple things. Um, you don't have to admit it, but you've probably done that as well. And so what we want to do then is add this code anywhere inside the on-device ready. I'm going to say, let's add it at the end of the function. So the end of onDeviceReady starts at line 6, and it goes all the way down to uh, 40. Uh, let's say we'll leave load name as the last thing. So we'll give yourself a new line, 40. Again, make sure you're inside the onDeviceReady function. What we're going to do here is to create an event handler. We're going to use some jQuery to search for an element on the screen in the project. Once it gets clicked, run a function called getURL, and then we have to define what getURL means. So in our code here, we'll start off with our syntax dollar symbol, open close parentheses, dot, open close parentheses, semicolon. That's our basic syntax. This is the jQuery selector. There's something on screen that we're going to select. In quotes, we're going to say dot btn url. There's some element somewhere in our project called btn URL. Specifically, what kind of element is it? It's a class because of the dot. So we're saying here, we've previously seen something like this, however, that had a pound symbol. That is selecting one specific ID in our project. Remember, IDs can only be used once per project. I want to do it this way because I want to have perhaps more than one button throughout my project. Right now what we're trying to do is fix inside of our art screen. Um, inside of our art screen we have the button for catalog. If we click that, that'll open the latest catalog of the college's website. Our app is reaching out to the college's website. The old way. We want to do it the in-app browser way. So I have one button that does that right now, opens an external link. I may want to have more than one button in the future that opens an external link. So if I use an ID, I'd have to rewrite a brand new 
event uh, listener, and I'd have to write a brand new function to handle it. So if I use a class, a class can be used multiple times per project. So all I need to do is set all the buttons that are relevant, class equals button URL. Inside of the second uh, parentheses, then, we have um, oh, one thing before that, on, sorry, on method upon this selector. We're selecting something and on a particular event in the quotes click. On the event of click, do the following, which is comma, function, um, open close parentheses, open close curly brace, Within the curly braces, we will um, run get URL function. So we're saying any button that we click on, run our get URL function. We're going to invent this in a moment. But at this point, you might say, well, how does it know which URL to get? If I can click on one of seven buttons within my app, to load one of seven different addresses, how does it know? It's going to know with this trick that I've got here. We will use this, the special keyword this, which refers to this thing that we've clicked. This particular button that we've clicked will help us then determine which address to load. Notice the way it's written. This is another jQuery selector. Dollar symbol, parentheses, this. So within the get URL, we'll write dollar parentheses. This is shorthand for jQuery. Inside, we've got this, no quotes. It's just the way it is, basically. This object that we clicked on, so we wouldn't put it in quotes because then it would be a string. We're not really selecting a string, we're selecting an object. This object that I've clicked on. Next line, we, ne we now need to define, well, what does get URL mean? Get URL is not a um, predefined JavaScript method. It's not a built-in command. We're going to invent it, so we have to define function. Get URL means this, means the following. And this is the syntax for, the, for functions. We've seen this a bit before. But because I'm going to write several lines here, I'm going to break these curly braces into two separate lines. So again, I like to teach write the pairs and then fill in the details because it's very easy to forget that curly brace write all of our code and I never closed my curly brace. So after we close the pair of curly braces, break that to a separate line before we go further. I'm running the URL and I'm feeding it a parameter this, the particular button that I clicked on. I need to pass it through into the function to work with it. And so the basic syntax of my get URL function is that I'm going to pass in a, a parameter called the URL. This can be anything I want. It could be called kitty cat, as long as I use this, the, the, ter the syntax or the terms exactly every time. But of course, why not name them to make sense? So I'm passing in the URL of the particular button that I've clicked, this particular button that I've clicked within the function. We then simply run that Cordova command that the documentation told us, cordova.inAppBrowser, so the Cordova object dot in app browser. Notice the, doc, uh, notice the capitalization, particularly the method open Uh, 
uh, we're going to run in at browser open. We're going to open. There's a method attached to that one that makes sense because we've got the Cordova object defined by Cordova.js. We saw at the Apache documentation that it takes three parameters the URL, comma, what target, comma, and options. So we will say the URL. That's what I'm passing into the um, open method. Yes, I know I have something there, but I'm going to skip it for the moment. Comma, uh, in quotes, blank, or that is underscore blank. That should be reminiscent for when we, when we talked about plain old um, when we talked about plain old HTML and making links. If we wanted a link to open in its own window, we did underscore we did target equals underscore blank. So that that follows through. One more parameter, option. In this case, I want to say location. Yes, I do want to show the address bar. If I don't want to show the address bar, I just put no. We have other options we can put in. So in quotes. We'll say location equals yes. Now what I skipped, and what we'll add in a moment, is we've clicked some button, this object. This object of the button that we clicked has a variety of attributes. An image, for example, has an attribute of width and height. It could have an attribute of style. I have a link. A link has an attribute of SRC. Um, if I have a link that I converted into a button, it has an attribute of data role equals button. So these objects in HTML have attributes. If I simply say this, it won't work because then though every single attribute of the particular button I clicked will be fed into the address. I need to specify the attribute of the address attached to the button. So notice what I've got here. This is some um, jQuery, I believe. The URL dot data. There's going to be a data attribute. Just like I've got data role, data transition, data add back button, there will be data URL equals an address. So here I'm saying give me the address attached to that particular button in the data URL attribute. That's why we also need to write a little HTML in a moment for this to fully work. So we'll say the URL dot data, open close parentheses, it's a method, it's jQuery method, quotes. Again, for this to make sense, if we had typed role here, this is like saying, what data role attribute do you have on this element? Data role equals button. Data role equals page. Data role equals footer. So this is like capturing that. What's the data role? It doesn't make sense here. Of course, it expects an address. That's what this is doing. So when we type URL here, we're going to check the data URL attribute of the button we've clicked on. Let me confirm all of this is correct. Location, semicolon at the end, the URL data, make sure you've spelled everything properly. In that browser, open the URL. I think I got it. URL. Okay, that's part one. Part one is writing some JavaScript. Then we'll write a little bit of HTML. Yes? I have a question. Hmm? You are basically calling an anonymous function. Uh, and then inside that function, you call a main function. Yes. Is that necessary? I believe, I believe so, because the, the way that the jQuery works here, of the on method, I believe that's the syntax for how it works. We can confirm in a moment. Yes, it would be a lot easier to simply do get URL. Uh, but 
Oh, I remember. Uh, we have to do it this way if we are going to run a function with parameters. If we, ju if we just simply put get URL with the parentheses, I don't believe it works. The parameter will be passed automatically. All you have to do is just add in the JavaScript. In JavaScript, by default, the parameter is passed to this function. All you have to do is add on the event. Possibly, but what if we wanted to pass more than one? We still can. Huh. Okay, that's something that we can test. Um, but that would make sense. Well, why not call the function all by itself without an anonymous function first? From what I understand and the documentation that I read, this was the right way, especially for more complex things. For perhaps a simpler one, it might work right off the bat with just calling the function, but um, I've had good results with being a little bit more verbose. That might be part of it as well, because we're tapping into the API of the device, it may have different constraints. Okay, so that's the, that's the part of the JavaScript. The part of the HTML in general, what we need to do is we will no longer be, be using the href attribute. We will be using a data URL attribute, like data role, data add back button. So we need to change that a little bit. Make sure your JavaScript file is saved. Save your Kodika file, and then open the index.html file. Then we need to find the spot where we've got that button. Remember, search is very useful. We've got a button called catalog on line 167. If you're using my file, it's 167. You need to find, if it's yours is different, you need to find where you've got the class schedule link. What I'm saying on my handout, uh, we can't use the uh, the href attribute um, the way I've got it here. We instead will repurpose the href. You see href. Let's change that to say data dash URL. Data dash is is a is a universal HTML5 attribute. We've been more most familiar with data role. Data role isn't isn't by itself jQuery Mobile. Data dash is HTML5, and then data dash URL is jQuery. I'm sorry, data data dash u data dash role is jQuery Mobile. And then here, then we've invented our own data attribute URL. So our code is then going to look. It's going to go look for this element and find this attribute data URL and whatever's in that data URL, in this case this address, it will then feed it back to the, the this uh, part of the function. Give me what's ever in the URL as that data element and use it. Now, this is not fully complete because we haven't said that that button should pay attention when it gets clicked. We haven't attached the class to that button to pay attention to when it gets clicked. So my handout further says, okay, replace href with data URL, and then add class btn URL. So we've got a data URL, rel, doesn't matter where we add it, but I like to add it as the last item after all the other attributes. I like to add IDs and classes. It's totally personal. It shouldn't really affect anything. But I like to add classes and IDs as the last thing, as the last attribute of a tag, btn URL. No dot, because that's class. Class equals. think at this point this is all that we need. What we want to do here is save it and run it. You decide now. Run it on your device. 
run it on your virtual, run it on your browser, but I know something's going to act a little odd in the browser that I'll talk about in a moment. But I'm going to run it in my device. So I need to taco run Android device. as mine loads up. If you're doing Taco Run browser, it won't want to work quite well. You want to check your console output for a hint why it doesn't work quite well on the browser. But um, if you run it on a device, it should work. Now I'm getting an error here. What could happen is I might have to uninstall the old version of my app there's a lot of variables here, of course. So I'm going to uninstall the old version of my app on my device. I'll try this again. Oh, no, it says no device found. Okay, that means my device is asleep for some reason. So I'll unplug it and I'll replug it. Okay, it should hopefully pay attention now. Failed to deploy to device. No device is found. Obviously, it's plugged in, but I'm going to plug it in unplug it and replug it and hopefully then it it obeys and there's been plenty of times that I just do the same thing again and it works um, or unplug it and replug it or uninstall the app and then try it and see what happens now okay that time it that one's fine it would have given me the error by now. So as we look at this output over and over, hopefully you don't have to understand everything that it does, but you should see, because it happens the same way over and over, you should see, you should get a feel about when is it working, when is it not. And there's a few parts where it can fail, of course. is another reason why you want to at the beginning of the day do your setup you want to set up your real or virtual device maybe do that taco run on your project just to wake it up for the first batch of you know compilation effort further times should be faster Installing device. It's loading up on my device. Um, just for fun, I'm going to load it up on my on Chrome here, so you can kind of see something. Uh, again, Chrome is going to be a little finicky. As soon as you close it, it'll complain. But you can bring it back via inspecting your item again. So I'm going to go to the art screen. I'm going to click on Catalog. On the device itself, it's uh, starting to load the website. It opened in an in-app browser. I don't really see anything interesting on my Chrome here, unfortunately. But on my device, it opened up a little differently. It didn't kick me out to another app. It didn't kick me out to my web browser app. I'm still within my... Uh, SDCE app, the, the top bar there kind of reflects that. I get a little X. Well, this is a real website and I can, of course, click on any of these things and it's opening a real website. Then I close, click the little X, it brings me back to my device. Yes, last time we were here, it kind of worked, but this is the more correct way that it works in an actual browser. Since we didn't specify it last time, it did what it wanted. Here we specified, open a browser in your, in your app. If you try to run it on a virtual device, it should also work. I won't try because it's going to take forever to, for mine to load up. But try it on your virtual device. 
it should work. You should see something that looks like it's popping up to show you a new website. Oh, you can kind of see it here, actually. Chrome is telling me um, I have my art classes screen open, and it opened the college's website. So it is opening up external content. If I, if I close that in my app, it takes me back to my app, and then here it's no longer, it's no longer there. Although it's, I guess it's still kind of in memory a bit. But I'm back on my my main project. If I open that external link again, you see right there, it opened up the class schedule. Oh, I can inspect it that way. Oh, yeah. So there. I'm looking at the class catalog. It's on my real device. I'm going to click on Access Beginning. And so it is opening in the external browser, and on my device, I close my device, and then Chrome will probably lose focus. And back on this device. Just to show you this, then we'll take a break. Um, taco run browser. I want to check my project in the web browser. Taco run browser. This is going to be independent of my device. To show you here, most likely you will get an error. And I'll explain what the error is. I've <coughs> got it in the browser, got my console open. I'm going to delete all this output here. You can delete your console output by clicking the clear console button right there. I just want to see my console fresh. So if I click that little clear button, then I will go to art, and then I will click catalog. The browser is trying to show me an external website in a built-in web browser, like I would see an Unreal device. But it doesn't allow me because then it says, a big scary warning, refused to frame this link because it violates the following CSP, Content Security Policy. Default source, blah, 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 blah. Note that frame source was not explicitly set, so default source is used as a fallback. And it's telling me right here, index, something in the index file. This is coming from line 9. One of the lines we copied from index 2 into our current index is this right here, content security policy. This is what I said. We're elevating a web app to be a full powered mobile device app. Our mobile devices are mini computers in our pockets, and therefore they could be exploited. Uh, there's the XSS, cross scripting security type of attack, which is that you're running JavaScript command in your app from some other server and then suddenly your app is compromised with someone else's code. Maybe some other site gets hacked, they change that JavaScript supporting file and now your app is hacked. Now every app is hacked because every app is connecting to that JavaScript file. So the CSP right here, Content Security Policy, is, de is then designed to create like a whitelist, an approved list of resources for your app to use. So it's all explained here under content. <coughs> the way it works is we have default source, a bunch of little attributes, and then a semicolon. So everything between default source and that semicolon means something. 
then we have style source, and that goes on for a little bit until a semicolon right there. And then we have media source. It's the last item, so it doesn't have a semicolon. So this is saying anything regarding style, anything regarding CSS, what is safe to use via CSS is anything self, anything within this project, anything inside the folder, I believe, or anything that's unsafe inline. If you wrote any inline CSS, it's okay to use. Any CSS within this project and any CSS that's inline is okay to use for this project. Media source, any picture, any media is okay to use with the little universal asterisk, the wild card, anything. Any picture is okay to use. Pictures aren't usually a problem. Backing up here, we've got the default source. If I haven't defined any other source, and we've got a bunch of them to work with, if I haven't defined any other source, go back to the default. And the default is saying self works, anything that has a protocol of data works, anything that has a protocol of gap works, anything that has that uses this website works. If I'm trying to load an external website at sdce.edu, it's not on the whitelist. Only gstatic.com is there. Actually, only the subdomain ssl.gstatic.com is there. That's the only external website I can access. And I'm trying to access sdce.edu. That's why it's not allowing me. And then one more unsafe eval. So to make this fully work, I saw that it worked on my device, and it should have worked on your emulator. But another way to fully test it for full security is right here. It's saying, no, we're not going to load sdce.edu. It's not an approved domain. And notice it also says, you did not specify frame.source was not set. Therefore, we'll fall back to default source. So we can either add the sdce domain to the default source, or create a frame source um, directive for it to work. I will create a new directive to see how that works. If you'd like to do this, this is a bit optional, but if you'd like to do this, you can go to line 9 of your index. At the end, before the quote, add a semicolon because I'm going to add a new directive or a new attribute or whatever the official term for this is. And I will say frame dash src space in single quotes http colon slash slash sdce.edu. That's the domain I'm trying to load in a frame in an external in the in app browser. We might have to specify www. We'll see in a moment. But the thing is that this CSP on the one hand is very good because it's it's security but the problem always with security is the balance between security and convenience something that is very convenient is not very secure and something that is very secure is not very convenient so the most convenient thing is delete line line nine, line nine if you delete line nine super convenient there's no security anything loads up Super convenient. I don't have to figure out this. And this gets very complex when we talk about the map, the Google map. When we connect to the Google map, the Google API, we have to edit the CSP a lot because Google is going to load up things from a secure server and an unsecure one and this subdomain and that subdomain and this image. It's, it can get pretty complex, the CSP meta tag. But I think for this, it should work. Remember, no semicolon at the end because it's the last one. And actually, just a moment, sorry about that. No quote, no quotes around the address. I just saw it here. Yes, quotes around strings, I guess, like self and unsafe, but no quotes around the address. So sorry, take that, take that back. No single quotes. See, I don't have it memorized either. I have to look it up. Or look back on my previous project that worked. So I think there, that's fine. I'll save it and run it in the browser, because I didn't see this issue at all in the real device. Okay. 
notice the syntax of it. There's semicolon separating these things, but there's nothing like frame source colon like we would see with a CSS attribute. Uh, why they didn't use something like that, maybe they couldn't, but if that sort of syntax has existed for CSS, for example, why couldn't they follow it for this? Let's see if this did it. Go to art. I'll click on catalog. Not quite. I think possibly might have to specify the whole the whole address. But then the problem with that is I, if I click anywhere else, it goes to a different address because it is set X frame options to same origin. Well, guess what? ContentSecurityPolicy.com has the whole specification. We're going to take a break, and if you'd like to read that, you can. But I'm going to move on. So it's uh, 7:35. We'll take our uh, our break. We'll come back at 7:45. Maybe read into ContentSecurityPolicy.com, and then we'll maybe deal with it.